Bible quiz. Y'all ready? It's Sunday school morning. We're going to get a Bible quiz. Everyone is allowed to answer these questions except Miss Debbie. She's off the hook with this one. Now, during Bible school, we studied a lot of different folks, but one night we studied King Josiah. Who can tell me something about King Josiah? Do, 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 do. Kaylee, what can you tell me about King Josiah? No, I'm going to be there when you're ordained. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be there with my hand on your head, whether you ask me to or not. I'm going to tell you that right now, girl. King Josiah, considered to be the best king ever, Israel ever had, right? Eight years old, he became king, and his father had set up idols, or allowed idols to be set up, and even had some in the temple. And they went in the temple, and they found a scroll. They didn't even recognize it anymore, and guess what the scroll was called? The Book of the Law. We call it by a different name. We call it Deuteronomy. We just read one chapter of it. But you need to hold that in mind, that it was a kid who gave his life to Jesus, to God. Jesus was there too. We just didn't know him as Jesus at that point. A kid gave his life to God. Keep that in mind as we look at the lesson this morning in more detail. Now, if you found yourself glazing over, I know it's hard. Because especially Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is one of the books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. And when you hear Deuteronomy, you usually think it's going to be a bunch of laws, right? It's a lot of, a lot of stuff that you've got to remember. It doesn't make much sense to you. Well, let's look at how it starts. In the first chapter, it says, These are the words that Moses spoke to Israel beyond Judea. And he recalled their history. He talked about the years they spent in the wilderness. How many years did they wander in the wilderness before they crossed into the promised land? Forty. Y'all should know that one. Forty years wandering in the wilderness. Then in chapter 4, Moses tells the Israelites, listen to these statutes and ordinances which I teach you to do them, that you may live and go into possess the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, gives you. He also charged them to make them known to your children and to your children's children. And then in chapter 5, Moses recites the second telling of what we call the Ten Commandments. They were originally given in Exodus, the 20th chapter. Now, by the time we reach chapter 6, which we just read in its entirety, thank you, John, for reading all that to us, he gives the Israelites the commandment that will become known to them as the Shema. Can you say Shema? Shema. Shema literally means here. Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. And he says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's saying there is only one God. There is God, and that God is our God. And you shall love the Lord God, how? With all your, with all your heart, with all your, thank you. Look, we got a cheat sheet up. I saw the reflection coming up there. Say it with us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Jesus quoted it that way and added the, the mind in there as well. But Orthodox Jews say this every morning. The first thing out of their mouth is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And before they go to bed at night, to remind themselves exactly what it is that God told them to do. So this is Moses' kind of sermon about that verse of Scripture which is really a retelling of the first commandment. Here's your second Bible quiz today, and if you're feeling like I ought to get more time with my Bible, good thing. What's the first of those Ten Commandments? You shall have no... See, it's coming right back. You shall have no other God before me. Doesn't it sound better to say, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength? And we're told to listen, to hear. Hear, O Israel, Shema, hear. Now, 
What are some of the things that you hear if I stop talking? You hear me talking now. What are some of the other things you hear? In this room right now, can you hear anything? You're holding very still. Hmm? Paper shuffling. Anybody hear any snoring going on? If you do, we'll, we'll poke that person in the side and wake them up. Now, that's listening, right? Because you hear things and you don't even pay attention to them. Listening means you're paying attention. But what they mean here by hero Israel is more than hearing, more than sound bouncing off your ears, more than listening actively. To hear is to obey. To hear is to observe what you've heard. And so it's the restatement of the first commandment in positive terms. Instead of saying, you shall have no other gods, we're saying our God is one. Our God alone is God. And how are we supposed to love our God? With our heart. Not with the heart beating in your chest. And in ancient Israel, it's not the same as I love you with all my heart. Well, we say that. We tend to mean our feelings. But I love you with all my heart means I love you with my inner being. All that is within me, I love you. It's loving God to your core. Soul is not soul like we think when we die, our soul goes to be with Jesus forever, because that is not an understanding of ancient Judaism. Their understanding of soul was the life force that God breathed into Adam in the garden, that breath of God, that life force. So it's all that you have within you. To love God with your might and your strength doesn't mean that you need to be strong, doesn't mean anything about physical strength or even courage. It means that everything God has entrusted to us we entrust to God. So we love God with all that we have, all that we are. That is a blessing. But love is not a feeling at all. It's not about what you feel, because who do you love? Who do you love that you know? How many of you remember holding your baby for the first time? What did you feel then? Let me ask Linda and Milt. Milt, what did you feel the first time you looked at that red-haired girl next to you? Did your little heart go pity-pat in your chest? Did you know when you saw her that this was the one? How about when you saw your grandchild for the first time? Talk about your children, thinking something about them. When you saw your grandchild, how many of you were overwhelmed with a feeling you didn't think was possible? That's love as a feeling. That's not how you're supposed to love God and not how you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. It's an act of will. It's a decision. I will love. I will love. I will love because that is what we are called to do in God's name. I didn't read the gospel lesson this morning that goes with this one, but it's Jesus being approached by someone who is trying to trick him up, trip him and say, into saying something blasphemous. And they say to him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And what does Jesus respond? You should know it by now. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. He says the four things. And then he says the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, an act of will, a decision that we will live in love. And what are we supposed to do with this teaching? We're supposed to teach to our children and to our children's children. When they ask us, why are we listening to these, these teachings? We say to them, because once we were slaves in Egypt, because God has led us to freedom. And so we will continue to repeat this every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. We will love God with all that we have and all that we are. Everything inside us, every thought, conscious or unconscious, to show love to God. And Jesus says the second is like the first, love your neighbor as you love yourself. We're supposed to be teaching our children these things. So this morning, it was a strange morning to be preaching. I'd been away for two weeks, and I hadn't decided what I was going to preach when I came back. And I knew that yesterday was the anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and what would have been an attack on the White House had those folks on the plane not taken choice that they made to crash the plane. They thought they would die anyway. and They weren't going to let anyone else be hurt by what had happened. That's loving your neighbor more than yourself right there. But when we tend to remember, we remember that sometimes in ways that lead us away from who are called to be in Jesus Christ. We remember the pain of that day. How many of you can tell me exactly what you were doing when you heard that news? I remember myself exactly what I felt. My husband was out of town on a business meeting. I did not sleep that night. I had to force myself a day and a half later to turn the television off and look away from it because it was so overwhelming. 
one of the things that I was supposed to do that day was get my hair cut, and I called to cancel my appointment, and my hairdresser was crying, and he said, please come to be with me. I'm by myself. So I left my mom at my house, and I went to be with him for a little while, and then went back home again because people wanted to be with someone they knew and they loved and trusted. People were scared what's going to happen next. People were frightened for their lives. People were frightened for the lives of their families and their friends and their children. And that evening, I don't know what happened here, and some people said they remember Bill Brown having a service, but I opened the doors of my church and people came in from the neighborhood, not just members of the church, some of them came in. And we prayed together and we read scripture together. And we talked about peace because people were feeling a need for something other than peace. They were talking about we need to act. There were others who feared what that retribution might look like. It was a difficult day. Do you know what happened the next Sunday? It was the highest recorded attendance in churches around the world that Sunday, particularly in our nation. People of different colors coming together. People of different backgrounds. People of different orientations. People of different nationalities coming together to pray that what had happened might not happen again. But do you know what happened in the Sundays that followed? Fewer and fewer people came to the church. And more and more people called for acts of revenge. That's why this morning we stopped and we remember those folks who gave their lives. We remember them with gratitude. We remember their sacrifice. And we think about those children who have grown up without their parents. People who have gone on for years without their spouses. People who said goodbye that day to their children. And all those who came out to help. There was a church in New York City, a historic church. And before 9-11, they had spent most of their money on preserving their building because it was a historic building. And they opened their doors to let firefighters sleep there as they could. And they left the scuff marks from their boots on there. People at first said, oh, we have to clean this up because we have this historic building. And then they said, no, this needs to be a monument to what happened here. And they showed their love for these firefighters by never cleaning up after them. And if you go to that church today, among their relics of their history would be the scuff marks from the boots of firefighters sleeping on their pews because they were trying to do what they could. But today is also the day that we kicked off Sunday school. Next week, classes begin, but today the kids were out there playing, and Jeremiah's a little bit wet back there, wherever he's sitting now, because he got a little, a little carried away with the sprinkler. But they had fun, and they played games. But they are here because we have a charge given by Moses, given by God. You shall teach these statutes to your children and to their children after you. And when they're grown and they say to you, why do we spend time learning these things? You say to them, because we were slaves once. We were slaves in Egypt because that is our history as well. There would be no Christianity without the Jewish family. The Apostle Paul himself said, we are just a branch grafted onto the tree that is Judaism, that is God's chosen people. So we were once slaves in Egypt. We were once slaves to sin. We were once slaves to the way things used to be done. We were once slaves to revenge and passions that did not reflect who we are in light of Jesus Christ. But now in Christ we are set free and we are called to teach and admonish one another. What a world we would live in if every morning everyone who belonged to God in Jesus Christ as well as everyone who belonged to God from the ancient Israelites forward would begin the day by saying, Hear, O Cockeysville. Hear, O Phoenix. Hear, O Timonium. Hear, O Lutherville. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your heart. What if we began every day by reminding ourselves who we are? There is a man whose name is Primo Levi. He has since died, but he was an Italian chemist, and he was Jewish. And he spent 11 months of his life in Auschwitz prison camp. He was a survivor of the prison camp. He wrote a poem called Shema. Hear, O Israel, hear, obey. I'm going to read a little bit of that to you now. It's, it's a strange poem, and I hope you'll open your minds to thinking about it. You who live secure in your warm houses, who return at evening to find hot food and friendly faces, consider whether this is a man who labors in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread, who dies at a yes or a no, Consider whether this woman without hair or name, 
with no more strength to remember, eyes empty and womb cold as a fog in winter. Consider that this has been. I commend these words to you. Engrave them on your hearts when you are in your house and when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise. Repeat them to your children. Or may your house crumble, disease render you powerless, your offspring avert their faces from you. This is a man who did not forget when his time at Auschwitz had passed. And again, his life was more comfortable. And he went on to have a good career after the, those days. But he never forgot where he had been, but he did not let those days define him. And he said, these are the words of our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you don't, calamity will befall you. Now, why did I bring up King Josiah in all this? Because we have seen the results of what happens when the story does not get shared with children. And Josiah was just a child himself when he gave his heart to his God gave his heart to his God. And in the years that he was king, until he himself was killed in battle, he removed all the idols, even those that his father had allowed to be set up in the temple of God itself. He had them removed, had them burned, and had their ashes carried from Israel. We need Sunday school teachers. How's that for a segue? We need Sunday school substitutes. We need people who are willing to say, I'm going to give my time because it's worth it. I'm going to have no other God before me. I'm not going to say I'm too tired or I don't know enough. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm going to say the children of this congregation need me to teach, and so I will be there when I am needed. I will teach so that they know, so that they never forget. Because that is what Moses told us to do. That's what God told us to do through Moses, actually. Let your children know these teachings. Now, they talked about buying them on your doorpost. Do you know what a mezuzah is? Jewish families lots of times have a mezuzah. It's a little plaque, a little usually piece of metal that is on their doorpost. And lots of times, what words are on it but the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. When they go in and out of the house, they'll kiss the Shema. They won't kiss the they won't kiss the mezuzah. They'll kiss their hand and touch the mezuzah when they go in and out of the house. Find them on your forehead or on your wrists. Well, that's a phylactery. Sometimes you'll see pictures from scripture, illustrations of the, the chief priests with and the Sadducees and the Pharisees with a little thing on their head. It looks almost like a West Virginia miner's light to go into the mines. A phylactery contains a tiny, tiny scripture written so that they wear it on their hand or on their wrist. Engrave them on your hearts. Literally means to carve it into your heart, the love for God that we are called to show to other people. We need to do that, and we need help doing that, or our children will grow up not knowing these stories. They will grow up not knowing their Lord and their Savior. They will grow up not knowing that they are called to love God and by extension to love one another because you can't love one without the other. Now, it's amazing, isn't it, that a lot of the trouble in the world can be led back to this story. Because when God sent the Israelites into the promised land, the Hebrews at that time, they weren't Israelites until there was an Israel. When God sent them into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, which is what this passage is about, getting ready to enter the land that God has promised, what did he say to them? You're going to draw water from cisterns that you did not hew. You're going to eat the fruit from trees you did not plant. You're going to harvest what you did not sow. Beginning of a lot of trouble in the world because the land was already occupied by the Canaanites. And isn't it sad that most of the world's problems, what's going on now in Afghanistan, can be led back to Muslim versus Jew versus Christian, the people of God made to love one another. Did you know that when Christians who are born in those lands, Palestinian Christians, their children are often tattooed near the time of their birth with a cross on their hand. They put it on their dominant hand so that they know 
when they do business, everyone will know exactly who they are. Even in places where to be a Christian is to put your life at risk, they will show the cross as a sign of who they are. So I invite you now not to forget these passages, to understand that God is calling us still to teach our children, to teach them again and again and again so that they might teach their children, so that these words that are so precious to us would be precious to them. They would devote their lives to teaching the generations after them. You are all here this morning because somebody loved you enough to tell you the good news of God and Jesus Christ. You are all here because somebody let you know the depth of God's love for you. So we need to let others know. Hear, O Kakisville, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, and with your might. Write it on your doorpost, engrave it on your wrist, engrave it on your heart, and teach your children the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.